continuing with simple transistor amplifiers. On the screen, you see the network analyzer of the analog discovery. It is sweeping the design that we did in part one from 10 hertz out to 100 kilohertz. And what is displaying at the top is the gain of the stage, and at the bottom is the phase. Suppose, for example, that this were a hi-fi amplifier. Well, you're interested in frequency response, but you're also interested in things like transient response and so on. In my opinion, if you're starting out and you're thinking of buying some equipment to do experiments like the one we're doing in this uh, simple transistor amplifier video, I think the best thing to do is to get an analog discovery. I'll show you one of the reasons here. Now, what we're doing on the analog discovery automatically, you can do manually with a setup like this. On the left is a small audio generator. I think it goes to 100 kilohertz or maybe a little higher. It'll do sine and square wave. I think it costs about $50. This Velleman HPS40 is an older oscilloscope that I bought many years ago. I found one recently online for $129.99. But my point is that for about 200 and I think it's $79 now, quite a bit less if you're a student or an academic. Actually, the student price is even better than the academic price. You can get one of these analog discoveries and it will plot all of this for you as well as work as an oscilloscope, a signal generator, and a plethora of other things that are useful to EE and other students that might want to study electronics or electrical phenomena in general. On the breadboard is the circuit we built last time and above it to the left is the analog discovery 2. You may recall we built it from this circuit and I have made a couple of additions and a couple of changes to this circuit in the meantime and I've also redrawn it so that it might be a little easier given all of the busyness of the last diagram. You may recall we inserted an emitter resistor about 100 ohms. We decided to give it a gain of 10 by having a 1K collector resistor to a 100 ohm emitter resistor. The ratio of 1K over 100 is 10, so we get a gain of about 10. And then we biased it using these two resistors by the method we talked about in part one. But I noticed that the transistor was drawing a little more current than I wanted. Now that was partly because we assumed a beta of 100. But we measured the beta on this transistor and we know it was 250. So what I did is I increased the value of this resistor to 2.2K and I increased the value of this resistor to 22K. I've also inserted capacitors at the input and output. I've done that for a couple of reasons. The one in the output is anticipating the idea of connecting this to another stage to get more gain. So we want to figure out how can we calculate a good value for this capacitor. And to do that we need to know what the impedance is looking into that point. In other words, if you had an impedance meter and you put it from this point to this point, you wouldn't read 2.2k ohms. You would read some different value because there are other components like this resistor, the transistor, that are also connected to that. So let's see if we can figure out how we can determine that. First, we'll start by figuring out how we can determine the impedance looking into the base. First thing we do is we look at this circuit and this triangle simply indicates that it's looking into the base of the transistor. Now, when you look into the base of a transistor, you see a resistance that's due to the transistor itself. It's called RE. We've been ignoring that up till now. Then you also see RE 
that is the emitter resistor. This RE follows a relationship called Shockley's relation that we will talk about very briefly, but not the physics. It involves charge and uh, Boltzmann's constant and a bunch of other things that are irrelevant to us at this point. But what we can do is redraw that circuit like this circuit. That is, we can replace the path to ground with a diode. In this case, we're going to call it a perfect diode. No such thing, but... And the reason we can call it a perfect diode for our purposes is we've moved this resistance, the dynamic resistance, or what you might call Shockley's resistance, out of the transistor and put it in series. So for our purposes, we're treating these just like the sum of two resistors. But by putting a 100 ohm resistor here, that also gets multiplied by HFE. So the total emitter resistance, or, or I'm sorry, this emitter resistance's effect on the input is HFE times the emitter resistor. Well, once again, well, for our transistor, that's going to be 25K, but even if the uh, transistor is a one that's at the very bottom of the HFE range, we still get 10K. So we're going to use 10K for our calculation. So our problem then just comes down to we have three resistors. We have the 22K resistor that we put up here, we have the 2.2K resistor that we put down here, and then we have the resistor looking into the base. Those are all in parallel. 22K in parallel with 2.2K in parallel with 10K. That turns out, if you calculate that, to be about 1.66K. We're going to just call it 1.5K. We now want to find the right size capacitor so that it is equal to R. We've determined R is 1.5K. So we want to know what is XC such that it has a capacitive reactance of 1.5K. This is a reactance chart. What it shows is this axis shows the reactance, and we want about 1.5K. This, this line or uh, graph shows capacitance. And then over here is the frequency. We're going to choose two frequencies for an example. One is 10 cycles, the other is 50 cycles. So I've drawn a line from 10 cycles to 1.5K, and you see that it crosses this at about 11 microfarads. For a 50 cycle half power point, or 3 dB point, it crosses the axis at about 2.2 microfarads. We now have these two values, 2.2 microfarads and 11 microfarads, and for our purposes we're just going to call that 10. So I've inserted two 10 microfarad capacitors in the circuit, one at the input, one at the output. The, on the far left is 1 hertz. This line is 10 hertz. This is 100 hertz. This is 1000 hertz, 10,000 hertz, 100,000 hertz. Nonetheless, you can see that the gain and the phase over the range from 10 hertz, which is where we calculated that our capacitor would be 3 dB down. And so we are down about 3 dB at 10 hertz. Okay, what we have determined is that we can actually set the low frequency response of this amplifier by adjusting the capacitors that couple the input and the couple between stages. So the next segment is going to be on putting two of these amplifiers back to back and seeing what effect that has. I've added another transistor stage. In other words, it's a duplicate of the first stage and I've coupled the first stage output to the input of the second stage using the same 10 microfarad capacitor. So let's take a look now at the network analyzer. The 3 dB point has moved up a little bit. 
it used to be right about here at 10 hertz but it's now at about 12 hertz or so when you cascade amplifiers like this each of which has a certain bandwidth the overall bandwidth of the group tends to get narrower now you may also notice on the far right that I have removed the capacitor that was shunting the high frequencies. So I hope what you have seen here is how you design a transistor amplifier, how you calculate the values of the resistors for bias and for uh, operating point, how you calculate the coupling capacitors for frequency response primarily at the low frequency end, and how you can use an instrument like the analog discovery to test the frequency response and the gain of the amplifier. Remember now we have two amplifier stages and it's what's called cascade. And now we can talk a little more about why we put a 100 ohm resistor in the emitter. We did that to give this circuit local feedback. In our case here, it is negative feedback to make the circuit more stable. It also increases the input impedance, lowers the output impedance, widens the bandwidth, and does all kinds of good things. So you say, well, that's great. Then why don't we always do it? Well, it does have one drawback. It lowers the gain. So while this stage is probably capable of producing a gain of oh, at least 100, maybe 150. We're limiting it to a gain of 10 because of the choice of these two resistors. Feedback is when you take a portion of the output signal and through some sort of network, you connect that signal back to the input. If you connect it in such a way that this comparator reduces the input signal due to feedback. That's called negative feedback. Returning to our circuit, noting that by leaving this 100 ohm resistor in the emitter and leaving it unbypassed, two currents pass through that resistor. One current, of course, is the output current. Therefore, the voltage across this resistor reflects the output current. But because the resistor is also in the base circuit, the input current flows through that same resistor, or put another way, the voltage developed across this resistor by the output signal influences the input signal. Those are the sorts of things that once you understand the basics of determining an operating point, setting up the emitter and collector resistors, finding appropriate bias resistors, and then adjusting the coupling capacitors to get the desired frequency response. You now have a little amplifier that you can cascade if you want more gain. You can experiment with things like how much of the emitter resistor to bypass, or if you want more gain, you might increase the value of this resistor. That will of course change your operating point, so you might then need to readjust the bias resistors. But nonetheless, as a learning tool, in transistor design, something like this can be very effective, especially when paired with uh, an instrument like the analog discovery that allows you to look at a wide variety of uh, circuit characteristics, including the frequency response and the phase response. I hope you've enjoyed this, and I hope you've learned a little something about transistor amplifiers if you haven't uh, known it before. If this is just a review for you, I hope that I haven't 
mixed up something or, or confused you in some way. In either case, I appreciate you uh, watching these videos. I hope that you'll learn something from them, and I hope that I'll be able to do some more of these in the future. In the meantime, have a nice day.